I haven't done a cartwheel since I was nine. I haven't seen my mother in a long, long time. This is the opening line to Lana Del Rey's song titled A&W, a song that is speculated to be influenced by the experiences of someone with an addiction or repetitive destructive behavior. Perhaps it touches on the inner dark thoughts of a person who's also experienced sexual abuse, and how even in attempts to rewire the outlook of it, she still feels empty and numb inside. A lot of sources explain that this line refers to early lost innocence. A cartwheel being used as a metaphor for doing something childlike, then her explaining that she hasn't done one since she was 9 years old. Now, this lyric got me thinking a lot about how many of us have lost innocence so early on. So, I was always described as naive as a kid, both by my partners, friends, even teachers. I never thought of myself as that. I always thought of myself as someone who had matured way quicker than most, uh, as most people my age tend to make me feel embarrassed about being a preteen. I suppose it was my anxious, shy tendencies that convinced people I didn't really know much. In reality, most of the time I'd just be in my own head, distancing myself from reality and my innermost daydreams and how one day I would be happy. So for the longest time, and I'm sure this is the case for a lot of young women, a lot of media has depicted that finding a husband is what will make me happy. I often dreamt about finding the one and him possibly whisking me away from the life that that I so desperately refused to acknowledge. Either that, or one day I'd have written a book that was life-changing. Perhaps then sign off to work with Disney or write comic books for Nintendo, and yes, this was genuinely what I wanted to do. Or maybe when I started my YouTube channel in the eighth grade. I would have been one of the big leagues by now. Maybe if the comments of the louder and bigger voices in my life didn't convince me that perfection was the only way to succeed, maybe, just maybe, I would have kept going. Now we're here. Wait, what am I doing? Oh, yeah, I'm working out. Okay, I'm working out. <sighs> A time in life where my generation's dreams are slowly being crushed. Dating is horrendous. Our generation is filled with trust issues, emotional distance, anger, depression, and past experiences that make us doubt everyone. No one wants to be vulnerable, and it's always men are this or women are that, but never how are both unique in their own ways. And that's not even diving into queer relationships. So I guess there goes a the dating life. Okay, well, what about working for Nintendo or getting an English degree? Well, I mean, I've only ever gotten 70s in essay writing. And creative writing isn't really a major, is it? Freelance? But with what time? All of it goes towards putting a roof over my head. When will I have the time to be creative? Let alone find the money for school in the first place. Guess a high paying job is off the table. As for YouTube? Four years and still no growth. You don't even have an Four years, years and pay. Is it yeah, even worth it? Are way. you even trying yeah, you hard enough? enough? No, you're gonna need a lot of subscribers to do that. Okay, fine, I'll be a teacher. I'll make everyone in my life proud of me. My mother will be happy. My father will be proud. My sister will also be cheery. And all I need is the validation of this crowd. My future husband will be impressed. I can finally afford that fancy dress that I've been longing for. I can live that picket fence life dream. I can become a stay-at-home wife with a kid or two or maybe even three. Everyone will be saved by me. As for myself, I... Counting on you. Others need me. That's all that matters. I don't need to live out my dreams. I don't need to find my purpose. I don't need to attend TwitchCon or get enough sleep or become my own person. I can do that within the path of life that has been safest to me. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another stream. Let's go. I found that doing YouTube and creating content has saved me mentally so many times. From addiction, from heartbreak, from friendship drama, from just wanting to escape reality. Live streaming, creating content, gaming, meeting all of you online has just brought me so much joy and has been my lifelong dream since I was a child to be able to even remotely even think about doing this. So. Thank you, everyone who watches. From the bottom of my heart, I think about how lucky I am to just be able to do something out of pure joy of doing it. But at what cost? Me going homeless? Those are hours I could be putting into picking up shifts. I could go full force into my promotion and work my butt off so I can make more money so I can attend school and get a 9 to 5 job. But then that's choosing a job that I wouldn't be happy with. Well, if that also discards having a job I actually want, that just means there's no point in living, right? I mean, that's the meaning of life, right? We get taught manners, we go to school, get educated, get a job, and then we work till we die. That's just life. If, if you, you don't, don't have, have a successful, successful money-making money career picked, picked out, out by, by the time, time you're 16, 16 you're, you're basically, basically destined, destined for, for failure. failure. If you don't get a degree, you will be of no use to society and therefore deemed worthless. If you drop out of school, you're gonna be a failure. You're gonna be broke as shit and end up working at McDonald's, working at McDonald's for 60 years.
<laughs> it's crazy how I was given this narrative my whole life and yet somehow this is the path I ended up on. I was talking with my one friend the other day. She told me, Rachel, we work in what is known as the worst job in the world. Compared to a nine to five, we get stressed out way more, treated like shit by customers and for way less money than an office job. After that talk, there was a shift in my mind. Do we really work for the worst job in the world? I've been here for five years and sure, the job is stressful and they only really give two people benefits and the hours are shit and paying it great, but I never really thought it was considered the worst job ever. That can't be true. I mean, there are jobs that are basically borderline illegal. Like that sewage job from Shameless. Now that's gotta be the worst job. Sure, maybe from an outside perspective, maybe my life's journey doesn't seem like it has prospects. I mean, I dropped out of having a teaching career. I have many mental health issues daily. Trust me, my coworkers know. I work a fast food job that doesn't even give me or anyone enough hours. I live paycheck to paycheck, constantly wondering if I'll ever make it out. Hell, for old times sakes, I was a religious goody two-shoes saving for marriage my whole life who followed the book of rules daily and yet somehow I managed to lose my virginity to a gay man. I laugh about it now. <laughs> But I mean, for a time, I remember feeling like my life was a joke and whoever the higher being was, was slaying some sick prank on me. Thank you very much, by the way. Someone in my life once told me, in life, we consistently have ups and downs. We don't get a say on when or why it'll happen. We can't control that. All we can really do is hop on the roller coaster when it's running, but know when it's unsafe to do so. Basically, if you're at a low point in life, sometimes it's okay to hold up the promotion. Sometimes it's okay to let yourself bed rot for a week. It's okay if you'd rather do your dishes tomorrow instead of tonight. There's always time to pick up your sh** again later. Part of self-love is having self-compassion. It's understanding your mind and listening to your body when it feels like running a marathon is a good idea and when it feels like it needs a five-week hibernation. Growing up in a Western society, we get taught from birth that we must fulfill our duty and speed running our education so we can then move on to our lives as worker bees for the higher corporations and richer people. While they get to wine and dine and eat fine cheese, we're constantly handed the shorter end of the stick. The rich will only get richer, and the poor will only get poorer. We're taught grow up, get a job, live to work. Now, I've never been to Europe before, but my Italian professor once told the class that Western society glorifies the live to work mentality. Whereas in places like Italy, a place where people love taking life slowly, they instead have a work to live mentality. And that's where I think I am right now. I first fell in love with experience when I first trained in Toronto at night. The city lights captivated my heart and the idea that every single person there had their own goals or life story had just mesmerized me. That feeling wholeheartedly engulfed me and in that moment on the train I realized one thing. I fell in love with exploration. Before this moment of awe, I had been stuck in time. A week before the train ride, I had recently just started no contact with a long-term lover of mine. Even though we tried no contact numerous times, this time I was ready to commit. This time I was ready to move on. This time, he wouldn't keep me. Remember how earlier I mentioned that I was conditioned to think that a relationship would make me happy? Well, that was an understatement. Since I could remember, I had always been a hopeless romantic at heart. I remember being six and having a crush on the family friend who lived down the block. In fact, I wasn't really good at hiding it since both of her parents would always joke about it. They thought that one day we'd grow up and actually date. Years went by since 2009 and I never knew what happened to him. I hope he's doing well. Once I reached the sixth grade, I remember thinking to myself that getting a boyfriend would solve all my problems. I wrote in diaries my fantasies of getting a romantic partner that suddenly all the girls would want to be my friend. Popularity meant the world to me. It was something I never had, something I couldn't understand as a young girl. All I wanted was to be a part of that girl group and be invited to sleepovers and watch cable shows with them until three in the morning and then attend those middle school parties at the youth center. Heck, they sold pixie sticks, an orange crush. That's like the forbidden fruit for preteens. All I thought was that if I could get myself a boyfriend, all the pieces would fall in the right places. People would want to be around me. Life would suddenly just make sense. Turns out dating that boy in the sixth grade did nothing but help me fall in love with that tortured poet. In fact, Hayden did not carry me off on a white horse. Sure, I wasn't popular, but at least I knew a couple good songs. Since then, I've had a couple relationships here and there. Some relationships failed, some guys were just jerks entirely, and some of them I had also hurt. <sighs> then came Philip. Philip. He was my twin flame. My other half. The me who wasn't me. The male me. Someone who inspired me. Someone who taught me a lot. But someone who shadowed their deepest insecurities over my ray of optimism. Dimming the light so that I would go down with him. He was my savior, but also my deepest fear. Someone I confided in. 
but also someone I needed therapy for. He was magnetic, and I could never resist his charming force. I can never tell nowadays if he changed me for the good or changed me for the bad, but nonetheless, I had changed after him. As someone who relied way too deeply on relationships being something that would fix me, Philip was no stranger to it when it came to our relationship. Wrapped around his finger, that's what he said when I asked if he knew how I felt around him. He was aware, so was I. But little old me screamed, I can fix this, I can fix me, I'm the problem, not you. You could never hurt me, I will never leave you in the ways that your ex or your mother or your father As had. long as he's happy, I'm happy. As long as this means he'll live, all of this will be worth it. Even if in the end he doesn't love me or want me or even need me, I'll always be there to protect him. No matter how many times I have to be his metaphorical punching bag, as long as he's okay, life will always have meaning. In the end, even if he falls in love with that guy down the street, even if he revokes his I love you's and tells me that he'll be happier without a woman, in the end, even if this all hurts me to my core, being by his side will fix me. Fixing him will fix me. Breakups are never easy, especially when a trauma bond is formed. Especially when an empath meets someone who only cares about himself. Especially when no one ever knew that you were more than friends. Especially when the biggest part of your pain was his biggest secret. When his coming of age was your drowning in life. When him being in love means you not feeling like you're good enough. His happiness would have meant my downfall, and I'd be selfish to let my inner desires influence his perception of himself. So I kept quiet supported him, and grey-walled until I'm numb. I don't want to make this a sob story for those of us women who've experienced their male partners being gay. They have just as many, if not even more, inner demons they're facing. You know, for example, uh, appearances to keep up because for some reason- for some stupid reason, it's okay when two women kiss, but when it's two men, yeah. Dude, get a room. As much as we love the easy narrative of someone just coming out of the closet and that's it, sometimes the coming out journey is a lot more traumatic, a lot more painful, and sometimes if there's internalized homophobia, there requires a fuck ton of therapy and self-work. A lot of late nights and deep discussions and isolation and fights between family members. I've seen with my own two eyes how torturous it can be. Sometimes this process lasts months, years even, before someone can truly find acceptance in themselves. Um, I thought you guys were going no contact. I thought we were too. When the person you love most sends you an email after three months of no contact, you can't help but wonder what it says. I mean, if he wanted to, he would, right? I blocked him on everything, and he still wants to keep me in his life. That must mean something, even if it is just friendship. But when you train two hours to see him, you expect things to be different. You expected that time in a new environment would have helped him move forward. You notice a little skip in his step, and he's glowing more than before. You then grow excited for this new dynamic and ponder all the new activities you might do together. You start to believe that the hurricane had passed and that he'd stop watering your garden with his covert affection. But then reality set in. People don't change. Someone like him doesn't change. You battle the voices in your head arguing, is the problem that he never loved you or that you never loved yourself enough to leave? After he questions why you never left and glorifies his cousin for leaving that toxic engagement and then you suddenly see yourself in his cousin's shoes. That could be you. You could start running. Run now, and this time don't look back. Ever. Perhaps for a while I deny too much the separation in this life, and perhaps one day we'll meet in another one. Maybe in that other life we found harmony. But in this cacophony of a broken rhythm, it's best we end this album here.